సుప్రభాతం సుస్వాగతం ఆన్ దిస్ వెరీ ఆస్పిషియస్ డే ఐ వెల్కమ్ ఆల్ అవర్ న్యూ ఐటెక్ వైఎస్ పార్టిసిపెంట్స్ హ్యూ జాయిన్ డస్ ఎస్టర్డే ఎవరీ మార్నింగ్ హియర్ వి మీట్ బిట్వీన్ సెవెన్ టు ఎయిట్ టు చాంట్ ద వర్సెస్ చోజన్ ఫ్రమ్ భగవద్గీత భగవద్గీత ఈజ్ ద మోస్ట్ కాంప్రహెన్సివ్ టెక్స్ట్ ఆఫ్ యోగా ఇట్ కంటైన్స్ ఎయిటీన్ చాప్టర్స్ అండ్ ద ఫోర్ మెయిన్ స్ట్రీమ్స్ ఆఫ్ యోగా ఆల్సో హ్యాస్ బీన్ ఎంబెడెడ్ ఇన్ దిస్ భగవద్గీత సో వి చోస్ ఎయిటీన్ వర్సెస్ ఆన్ ఈచ్ ఆఫ్ దీస్ ఫోర్ స్ట్రీమ్స్ ఆఫ్ యోగా అండ్ వి చాంట్ టుడే వాట్ వి చాంటెడ్ ఈజ్ ద భక్తి యోగా సిమిలర్లీ వీ హ్యావ్ జ్ఞానయోగ రాజయోగ కర్మయోగ అండ్ హౌ దెర్ ఇస్ ఎ యూనిటీ ఇన్ డైవర్సిటీ ఆల్సో హ్యాస్ బీన్ బ్రాట్ ఫోర్త్ సో ది ఎయిటీన్ వర్సెస్ దట్ హ్యావ్ బీన్ సెలెక్టెడ్ హియర్ హ్యాస్ బీన్ అరేంజ్ ఇన్ ఎ వెరీ సిస్టమాటిక్ వే టు గివ్ అ ద హోల్ స్పెక్ట్రమ్ ఆఫ్ ద భక్తి యోగ భక్తి యోగ ఇది సైన్స్ ఆఫ్ ఎమోషన్ కల్చర్ టు గెయిన్ మాస్టీ ఓవర్ ద ఎమోషన్స్ సో హౌ ద హ్యావ్ బీన్ అరేంజ్ యూ కెన్ సీ దాట్ In the beginning we have shloka number one which introduces you to the bhakti yoga. Then shloka number two and three how the grass emotions had to be transformed into subtle emotions, kama to prema. Then from prema how we have to go to the level of bhakti or the devotion, shloka number four to seven. Then what is the culmination of this bhakti? that is the god realization realization of god in form then we have god realization in non form nirguna sakshatkara then how a person is that nirguna sakshatkara stays how does he act that is called as the para bhakti then what happens to such a person who has reached great heights of bhakti at the time of death how does he leave the body once he leaves the body what happens to him where does he go shloka number 17 and 18 this is how the 18 verses have been arranged taken from bhagavad gita from different chapters you know then it has been now shown in the form of a schematic you know in this schematic you can see the whole spectrum of the bhakti yoga you know so how to start our journey in bhakti yoga how to gain mastery over the emotions first is the swot analysis what is our strength what is our weakness no the strength is called daivi sampat weakness is called asuri sampat daivi sampat is full of love no and magnanimity sharing giving full of brightness vitality energy efficiency and giving more and more more and more to others having less and less for ourselves less and less for ourselves these are the features of our strength or daivi sampat and what are our weaknesses the asuri sampat you know anger greed jealousy hatred infatuation arrogance in sanskrit they are called kama krodha lobha moha mada matsarya these are the six enemies of man it is told you know and krishna is extremely scientific in his exposition he says why do you call this as good why do you call it as bad why asuri sampati is called bad why daivi sampati is called good what is the definition of good and bad will it vary from place to place country to country from community to community no he gives a scientific definition as to what is good what is bad all those qualities which help you to go to greater and greater heights from our normal level you become great human beings super human beings divine human beings and reach that perfection itself called moksha those are called as the good qualities they are called as the daivi sampat and that makes us become free more and more free more and more free and overcome all the bondages 
and reach the highest heights of perfection. That is called as the good qualities or called the daivi sampad or called as the strength within us. Similarly, all those qualities which deteriorate us, which enslave us, which bind us, make us suffer from tension, stresses, diseases, and you will even commit suicide, full of depression. Such are the negative vices. They are called as the asuri sampath. You know. Then Krishna says we have the freedom. Either you can go this way or you can go this way. Choose your way that you want. To Arjuna, he is preaching in the war field. You are embodied, you are embodied with both the dimensions, but your daivi sampath is much more. Therefore, develop that more and more. You have a tremendous strength. The virtues, the good qualities you had, develop it more and more, more and more. You know? And that is the advice he gives to all of us. You know? We are all permutation and combination of these two things. <coughs> Daivi Sampat and Asuri Sampat. So what does every corporate, every the management system tells us? Develop our strength, strength of a organization, strength of a corporate, strength of a country should all be developed. And the weaknesses should be reduced called the SWOT analysis, strength and weakness analysis. This is what Bhakti Yoga says. And once you start saying, okay, I'm going to develop in the right direction, then you have to bring about the change, the change in our habits, change in our personality, change in our behavioral pattern, change in the way that we look at things. And all these things should bring about the necessary transformation so that we can start rising in the right direction. So in a corporate, in a society, in a country, we must all synergize ourselves to see that these virtues start developing in the society in a scaled up manner. And that's how the festivals are brought here in our country more and more so that each festival should help us to work together as a synergetic whole, irrespective of caste, creed, religion, sect, we should all work together to see that we grow higher and higher, bringing the basic principles of the Daivi Sampath. The strengths have to be developed. That's how in our country all festivals have been brought forth in various things. And therefore, to gain mastery over the emotions is the key essence of the Bhakti Yoga. But people have the wrong notions about Bhakti. Bhakti means you have to go to your temple or you have to go to, you have to have full faith in the God or Goddess. Unless you have these things, you cannot be a Bhakta, it is said. No. And not necessary. Krishna in the whole of Bhagavad Gita and the basic text of Bhakti called Narada Bhakti Sutra, it is never mentioned that way. If you have faith, good. If you don't have, equally you can be a great Bhakta. No. So what characterizes the Bhakti? You must develop the Daivi Sampath. Once you develop the Daivi Sampath, then you start in the path of Bhakti, it is said. And if you don't do this, if you don't develop your Daivi Sampath, what happens? Your Asuri Sampath is going to grow in you. Because that is nature. You know? Gravitation is the law of degradation. You know? So if you leave a stone, and just leave it, it will all roll down without any effort down. If you want to take a stone above a mountain, you have to put all the efforts. So to develop the mastery over the emotions, you must use all your power, your freedom, your capacities to see that we consciously change ourselves to grow to greater heights. Otherwise, we are going to go down. Unfortunately, you see, such deterioration is spreading throughout the world in various places. You know, Australia is a very wonderful multi-ethnic society. You know. But what is happening there? Our teenagers, students are all getting stuck with depression. You know. Thirty-five percent of the students, young students, all have become depressed. In an age where it should be bubbling with joy, enthusiasm, energy, vitality, sharpness, brilliance, you have become gambis. You know? Therefore, the government of Australia took this into consideration and said, we are going to solve this problem. Fifteen years back in Melbourne, 
a new project was initiated. The project is called Beyond Blue. We had an eye center in Melbourne at that time, and we all went to that big function. Hundreds and hundreds of people had come there. The Prime Minister of Australia was there, and he announced, and we had to stop this. And therefore, we have brought the best of the psychiatrists of Australia from Sydney University. Professor and the head of the Department of Psychiatry has been brought here, and he has made the director of this big project. And this huge building that we have, you know, nearly about 100 big office rooms and other things are all given to him. And initially, we have allotted $100 million to start. And I am asking the director, what is your delivery? In the next 10 years, the number should come down from 35% down to 2%, if not 0%. This is your job. No. Don't worry about money. If you want more money, we will give you. Money is not the criterion. You can use all technology that you want. And people were very enthused. Everybody was jumping with joy. Yes, this is the right direction. We want this, we want this. And it went on. No. Two years back, I was back there in Melbourne. I met the director and asked, how is the situation, sir? It's already 12 years. Said, no, don't. No. It has not decreased. From 35%, it's hardly 34% or 36%. Why? Because we have not understood the secret as to how to deal with our emotions. You know, the whole of the psychiatry has not understood the very basis of this. And the basis of psychiatry through the psychoanalysis started with Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud in England was a very great psychiatrist. And he used to have hundreds of patients every day with various types of depressions, hysteria, neuroticism, schizophrenia and others. So he found in all these people there is something which was common. What is that? Suppression. In the name of etiquettes, manners, culture, diplomacy and others, people were suppressing emotions. He was right. Therefore he said, don't suppress emotions, he said. Then what is the solution? What is to be done? Give free vent to the emotions. When you become angry, shout it out. If you want to hit somebody, go and hit the walls. You know? And don't suppress, you allow free vent to the emotions. America is a land of freedom. Freedom, freedom is the key essence of the United States. Therefore, this psychiatric psychoanalysis came handy and all people started using this free vent approach to deal with the emotions. Therefore, every youngster say, we don't have to care for anybody. We are the free birds of the society. And freedom is our birthright. And therefore, we don't have to care for our parents. Neither brother, brother, or the sisters, sisters, or grandfathers, anybody. We don't have to care for our teachers, or the faculty, or professors, anybody. And we have our own, own way of doing it. Freedom, freedom, freedom became the key essence of everything. Fine, nothing wrong in that. But what is the result? You know, in the name of freedom, it has turned itself into license. They have become slaves to these emotions. The strong Asuri Sampath have started engulfing them, enslaving them. What is the result of that? depression and the ascent. When I was talking to our friends in Los Angeles, you know, they said, why talk about Australia 35%? Here in America, we have 50% depression among the teenagers, they are telling. And addictions, becoming slaves have started increased tremendously. You know. And opioid addiction is the strongest addiction. Two years back, we had an international conference in Harvard University. And the theme was, role of yoga and Ayurveda in opioid addiction, that was the thing. And we had all the top researchers in Harvard University and others who came there and they were presenting. A lot of research has undergone. And the National Institute of Health 
funds all research in America. And they have allotted $2 billion for this research in a part of the National Institute of Health called NIDA, National Institute of Drug Abuse. The director of that NIDA is very close of a friend, Professor Dr. Rao Rapaka. He said, we have spent all the money, but no solution. All the people were literally crying. They took us to the next state called New Hampshire. And there, 35% of the people have become opioid addicts. They have a number of rehabilitation centers set up there. And they come there for one month, two months, three months, six months. And millions of dollars are spent. And after six months, when they get a little better, they are brought back to the society. Again, they go back addicts and crying, crying, no solution. Why? The secret is not understood. So, giving free vent to the emotions is no solution. You know, the first was right. Sigmund Freud was right. Don't suppress emotions. But the second solution he gave was wrong. Because the Bhakti Yoga tells the law of the senses has to be understood properly. What is the law of the senses? The senses, if you try to feed, the demand is going to increase more and more. Therefore, give free vent to the emotions will only increase your demand and therefore you become slaves to the emotions. Therefore, what is to be done? Here is a challenge. If you suppress emotions, it's going to have boomerang. If you give free vent, again it's going to have tremendous amount of problems. What is the way out? It's here that the Bhakti Yoga, the science of emotion gives us the secret. This is called sublimation. You know, what is the difference between sublimation and suppression? You know, I give a simple example of a novice driver who is driving recklessly. He is overtaking all other cars going very fast. 120 miles an hour is going and overtaking. Then he sees a red light there. He has to stop. But he is hopeful by the time he reaches the red, red is going to turn green and still he can maintain that speed going. He comes very near the red light, hardly about 10 yards, 30 feet. Then he sees a big police inspector staying to catch him. And what is to be done? He jams the brake. The whole car comes to a grinding halt. People in the car say, what a reckless driver he is. You know, they curse him. A master driver, on the other hand, he is also going fast. 120 miles. When he sees the red, what does he do? Diesel rates. 120, 100, 50, 20, 10. Comes to a smooth heart of the red. No? This is called sublimation. Difference. In suppression, you have all the energy of the emotions getting generated and you block it. It is going to boomerang. No? In the second, what you are doing? You are reducing the energy production. When you are decelerating, the flow of petrol or diesel into the car, you are reducing, cutting down. As a result, the energy that you are producing is getting reduced. So what characterizes sublimation is slowing down. So what is to be done in Bhakti Yoga is to convert our gross, violent, fast, powerful emotions of Asuri Sampath, anger, greed, jealousy, hatred. You have to soften them slowing down there. You know. And that is the secret that Krishna gives. So how to do that? You have to convert the Kama into Prema. Kama is the gross desire which is featured by the rush of the senses towards their object. You know. And you want to do that immediately, immediately. This is what happens to the drug addicts. When they are out of the drug influence, then they want one more drug to be taken. They are so far, the mind is so rushing towards the object. One more drug, one more pill, one more prick. That's all they want. They do anything. They go on and shoot the people and get the drug. That is the rush of the senses. The karma raises itself to this level of intense emotional upsurge of power. What is to be done? Slow down, slow down, slow down. How to do that? He said, convert karma into prema. 
prema is treated by giving not only you enjoy but you allow others also to enjoy so whatever you earn you give it to others as you grow more and more you give more and more to the society than what you receive jeevane yavat aadanam syat pradanam tadodhikam giving giving should become more and more more and more more and more you know and what character is a great human being he gives more and more takes less and less less and less the least for himself and gives maximum for others this is the difference between sublimation and suppression in the suppression there is a selfishness greed and this very very fast emotions so it has slowed down that the case is by giving and giving and giving so how do we start at bhakti yoga start giving every day you must give something you can give some money if you have some clothes or if you don't have anything it doesn't matter krishna bhagwan says a leaf a flower a fruit a cup of water every day you must start learning to give bring about the habit of giving and giving and giving you know so we had one of the professors in india institute of science when i was there in the faculty then the professor said i don't believe in that bhakti you know all this ritual that is being done is all useless i don't care for that you know then i said sir i know you i know how you behave i know what you are doing in your life according to me you are a great bhakta you are a great devotee i told him he said how is it possible i said what did you do when your father died yeah oh, as i told i never did any ritual you know i went to the crematorium and burnt him that's all then what did you do and what you do every year every year on that day when your father died what do you do yeah what i do i have great respect for my father and i commemorate and i gave a big meal you know for all of my friends when he died after a few days every year he and his wife you know prepare a lot of food taken to a orphanage and 100 orphan children are there they go and serve by their own hand for all the 100 children and give 100 rupees each and gives a set of clothes this is the feature of bhakti that is the prema bhava the first step in bhakti is to develop that prema bhava within us you know you may go to a temple and do that you can go to a church and do that you can go to a mosque and do that but if you don't have in belief on any of this still you can be a great bhakta great devotee that is the key essence that we have to do so what is to be done how to transform ourselves our behavior our action should show that we have started giving and giving and giving that is the key essence you know and this has been brought forth in our life in our country and we have the beautiful song that is the rashtra geet we had the vande mataram and the vande mataram that we are going to sing you know has been composed in our country it is a bengali poem written in bengali and also sanskrit by bankim chand chatterjee you know in 1870s so this was included in 1882 in a beautiful novel it's called ananda matha he wrote and this poem was first sung by rabindranath tagore as you know he is our nobel laureate in our country a great poet and a great philosopher a great thinker you know and he sung that in 1896 the first two verses of the song were adopted as the national song of india in october 1937 by the congress working committee who were trying to bring freedom to india prior to the end of colonial rule we got the freedom for country in august 1947 as we all know and here the poet sings the glory of mother bharat the mother goddess so in the later verses 
the song has been interpreted as the motherland of the people you know that is mother of bharat you know banga mata that is called mother bengal and later on bharat mata mother india though the text does not specify particularly the name mention of this thing explicitly it is done you know. and it played a very vital role how the bhakti can be used to liberate us individually how to liberate even a country is a great example you know and it became a very very important tool a power tool in our freedom movement that took place the first sung in a political context by dr abindr nath tagore you know in 1896 session of the indian national congress it became a very popular marching song in our country and everybody started singing and marching with these things you know and in the indian freedom movement 1905 spiritual indian nationalist and philosopher shri arbindo referred it as national anthem of bengal you know the song and the novel containing it naturally had to be curtailed so the british government banned it but the workers and the general public you know defied the ban and started singing and many went to the colonial prisons and there are the great personalities and not caring for the life they went in the freedom movement hundreds and thousands of people were behind the prisons and they were tortured to the great extent but still it did not happen and they went on singing repeatedly singing it and the ban was overturned by the indians after they gained the independence movement from the colonial rule in 1950 after india's independence the first two verses of the song were declared as the national song of the republic of india distinct from the national anthem of india that is janaganamana the first two verses of the song are an abstract reference to mother and motherland they do not mention any hindi deity by name unlike the later verse that do mention about the goddesses such as durga and others you know so in this what is conceptualized is the features of the bhakti and how bhakti can create ideal social orders how it can bring wonderful countries to the highest heights and what characterizes such a country you know what should a country have have been brought forth in this beautiful verses so let us chant this glory of the mother bharat please come up for the vande matram